Welcome back. You're still the Breakfast and Plus TV Africa. We're joined by Indibisu Wokoma, Professor of Economics, Director, Center for Economic Policy Analysis and Research, SEPA, and also Dr. Biodo Adedikbe, who is a founder and chief consultant uh, of BAA Consult. Um, gentlemen, very good morning to you. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for having me. All right. And uh, the world... Mm -hmm. But nice to have you. The World Bank uh, has said that uh, global headwinds um, are slowing Africa's economic growth as countries continue to contend with uh, rising infl inflation, which is hindering the progress of poverty uh, reduction. The institution also said the risk of uh, stagflation um, uh, comes at a time when high interest rates and debt are forcing governments to uh, make difficult choices in order to protect jobs, purchasing power, and development gains. Now, the findings are contained in the World Bank's uh, latest Africa Pulse uh, report. It's a biannual analysis of a near-term regional macroeconomic outlook. Now, the growth in sub-Saharan Africa is expected to uh, decelerate from 4.1% in 2021 to 3.3% in 2022 due to the slowdown in global growth, including flagging demand from China for commodities produced in Africa. Now, joining us to provide analysis of this as it affects West Africa's largest economy, Nigeria, uh, we'd like to uh, invite or welcome once again our guests. Um, we'll start with you, um, uh, Andrew Bissi Wokoma, Professor of, of Economics and Director, Director Center for Economic Policy Analysis and Research. Um, uh, what are your thoughts on this latest re research uh, report by, by the World Bank? Um, any surprises there? Uh, not much of a surprise, uh, in my opinion, because uh, uh, like uh, the song says, the answer is blowing the wind. When you see something that is uh, uh, coming up, for two critical reasons. Number one is like the problems that we have on the continent have always been there in terms of um, challenges to, to, to production, uh, inflationary trends, uh, various uh, countries, domestic circumstances, particularly for Nigeria. And then we have the Ukraine, uh, Russia, well, that is the other uh, factor. So if you go by what had been there before, the situation uh, in, in Nigeria, uh, for example, Nigeria has had uh, serious problems fiscal challenges, fiscal indiscipline. Uh, we have the debt problem. We have the problem in terms of uh, production caused by security. We have the problem, so we can't really produce enough and it affected prices, which had been there before the Ukraine uh, crisis. So um, the report by the World Bank is, in my opinion, is not surprised. It's always been there, but it, it has been you know, uh, increased or made worse by the crisis in uh, Russia and uh, uh, Ukraine because of supply of uh, food, wheat, and so on to the third world, which is also making the situation in Africa worse. So when this report came, you know, uh, came out, in my opinion, huh. it's a kind of a double jeopardy, uh, damping of economic growth and also uh, increasing of inflation, which is what they have to contend with. Interesting. Uh, 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 Dr. Biodo uh, in, in, in times past, it was uh, thought that uh, African economies like Nigeria's uh, uh, were immune, um, or I'm looking for a right word now, to um, the effects of global uh, crisis, for instance, the war between Russia and Ukraine. We can look at the first Gulf War. We can look at the second Gulf War. We can look at the, um, the war in Afghanistan and all these other wars around the world. And uh, even the, the subprime crisis in America at the time when, you know, the real estate market and the stock market and some things went down there, it, you know, we really didn't, really, really didn't feel the effect as much on the African uh, continent and Nigeria in particular. Um, what is different this time? Were those views valid? If so, what is different this time? Right. Very, very good observation. And thank you very much for that. Now, in those instances in the past, the African economy was not yet as integrated with the global economy as it is today. So when we had, for example, what you mentioned, the global financial crisis, 2008-2009, some things happened. Number one was that we're not fully integrated in the global system. Then secondly, Nigeria in particular, we had a very solid, call it, war chest in terms of our external reserves, which 
was able to bail us out, so to say, of the hemorrhaging of the economy because that period, a lot of foreign investments through that of Nigeria, net net, net capital outflow, to be specific, in 2008-2009 was $4 billion monthly. And that ran for seven consecutive months. Now, as of today, Nigeria is a lot more integrated into the global economy. Same with every other country in Africa. But I want to bring this perspective to it. Now, the problem we see today of the risk of stagflation did not start this year. It began in 2020 with the global pandemic, that is the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, many governments around the world, and that is talking about fiscal authorities, the monetary authorities, both stimulated the economy in forms of fiscal stimulus. Most governments around the world borrowed massively to stimulate the economy on the one hand. The monetary policies around the world also were accommodative, meaning that one, interest rates were reduced. Then, in some countries, they also went by way of what you call quantitative easing. That means central banks creating money, call it in economics, ex nihilo, all right? Then in some countries like Nigeria, the central bank went beyond the traditional tools and also went pragmatic by intervening directly in some sectors. That happened all around the world. So by the beginning of this year, what the World Bank has put in that report, some of us have been talking about it. Now, those activities stimulated economies. So 2021, most economies grew very strongly. In fact, the global economy grew at an estimated of 6.1% in 2021. Of course, you look at Africa also, over 4%. Now, projections made for 2022, 2023. And then we said with those stimulus and accommodative monetary policy, there was likely to be a trigger of inflationary pressures. And if and when growth now slows down, and inflation continues to rise, we are likely to see stagflation. So for some of us, we've seen this since the beginning of 2022, and I've been talking about it. So what the World Bank has done is just to issue a formal report to confirm what we projected would likely happen globally. What now compounded it, as Prof rightly said, was the Russian-Ukrainian war, and expectedly so, because between Russia and Ukraine, they supply about 25.1% of grains consumed globally. So and when there's a war between them, that means as much as that volume, or let me say proportion, of supply of grains to the global market will be out of the market. So naturally, that will cause shortage. And not only that, the war disrupted supply chains, which affected the movement of goods and services. And now China has rightly mentioned also which has been what you might call the powerhouse of growth for the global economy is slowing down because of crisis in real estate sector in China and, of course, also the challenges with COVID-19, that policy of zero COVID, which makes China lock down some areas that ordinarily should be producing and supplying the rest of the world. So all of these are not surprising, but it's the combination of the aggressive stimulus of economies in 2020 and then now growth is slowing down and inflationary pressures triggered by those fiscal stimulus and accommodative monetary policy are now coming. It's like saying the chicken has come home to roost. That's okay. what we are experiencing today. All right, so um, let's get back to Professor Ndubisi. Uh, Professor Ndubisi, are you still with us? Yeah, I'm with you. All right then. So, I mean, in, in, in clear terms, in re what will this mean now for 2023 if... Uh, you know, the World Bank forecasting or forecasts that uh, it's lowered its expectation from 3.3% to 3.2%. What does that really mean uh, in our reality for 2023? Well, what it means uh, for, for the country or for the ordinary person, for the, well, for the country or for the fiscal authorities or for the, those that manage, um, are managing the economy, it means that there's work to do. Uh, there's work to do in terms of uh, being able to uh, look inwards and see what can be done. Because um, until the problem in Ukraine and Russia is attended to, I don't think this, this, thing, this thing will go down uh, as quickly as we want it. Because not only about food prices or food, uh, Russia supplies virtually uh, Europe with uh, uh, gas and uh, oil. You know, Russia is oil producing. 
And uh, the, the price of gas and uh, uh, oil generally in Europe has gone very, very high. Even in the U.S., they have very, very high gas prices. And that also is because that affects uh, transportation. And also it, it, it's part of the factor that, that is it triggering the inflation. And of course, the, the factor of contagion, which is once you trade with a country or you have any dealings with that country, you are, you are affected by contagion. It's like contagious. That's the problem they have will be transferred to you. And that, that is actually what is at work. So for Africa, we trade with China. We trade with Europe. We trade with the U.S. So we can't, we can't avoid contagion. And the fact is that how do we manage it? The implication is that you need to begin to put your house in order so that the overall effect will be minimized. What you can control, the endogenous factors, what you can, what's within your reach, put your economies in order. Capital flows into your economy definitely will be affected. But if you put your house in order, you, the little that is going around will, will actually find its way to your borders. And a place like Nigeria, we have a lot of problems that we need to address. The, the, the level of oil theft is so high. There's, there's a lot of uh, you know, uh, loss of revenue, loss of income in the country. The issue, like I mentioned earlier, our problems are basically domestic. The ones you can't control, they are out there. The Russia, Ukraine, what's happened on you know post COVID nineteen, the massive injection of capital into the world economy, particularly in the US and so on. But what it is within our control is what we can begin to uh, to talk about. How is our level of production in Nigeria? How have we been able to address the issue of, of security? How have we been able to make the best of our oil resources? These are issues that even if you solve the global, the global uh, challenges, those ones are still going to be there. So what it means is like we need to put our house in order and make sure we, we address the issues, uh, we confront them. Be before Ukraine, uh, a Russia crisis, Nigeria also had a rising level of inflation. So we, we don't need to attribute the whole thing to the global phenomenon. Before Russia and Ukraine had their problems, Nigeria was having an increasing level of inflation. And if you look at uh, the Monetary Policy Committee of, this, uh, of the CBN, they have been, uh, for the past few uh, meetings, increasing the NPR because we need to take a look at what are the, the, the causes of inflation in Nigeria, which actually are things that, that can be handled. How many, how many people go to farm? Agricultural production has actually fallen. How many people go to farm and they are sure they'll come back safe? People don't go to the farm because of fear of being kidnapped or being raped or being, or, 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 or being killed. So these are issues. Being able to address the issue of production is basic commodities, cash crops, food crops, address the level of production. That's the issue of security should be addressed. They address the level of uh, hemorrhage in the oil sector. You need to address that. To, to be able to make sure that the economy stands. Address the issue of borrowing for consumption. When you borrow and you you talk about oil subsidies so high, so we need to address all those issues. If we address the domestic issues, then the effect of the global economy on us will be minimal. All right, interesting. Um, over to you, Dr. Biodo Adedikbe. Um, uh, um, Professor has spoken uh, about the, the, the two anchors of this report, uh, the, the you know, effect of the global uh, Russia-Ukraine crisis and the global headwinds on the Nigerian economy. Particularly, it talked about gas prices you know, skyrocketing in different parts of the world. We are well aware of uh, what's happening to the pound. And, you know, in the UK right now with the, um, with the uh, mini budget and the tax cuts going on there, people are going through a lot. Uh, they say it's, they call it cost of living crisis. Now, here, uh, when we talk about immunity to these global headwinds, Prof has talked about gas prices. Should we really be in this situation or should Nigeria be really, really benefiting and reaping from the increase in oil and gas prices globally? In as compared to, say, a country like Ghana who doesn't have as much mm. and is having a struggling inflation, which is even worse than what Nigeria is facing right now. That's number one. I want you to also, you know, shed s some light on what he raised about food insecurity. Um, you know, as, it, as they say it in this report, uh, one, over one in five people in Africa suffer from hunger. And this food insecurity has further been increased by COVID and then the current uh, global crisis with uh, a reliance on grains from Russia and Ukraine. So should we also be very dependent on these uh, countries for uh, such you know, agricultural products? All right. Thank you so very much. Now, the, the first issue 
which again, as rightly said, is a global phenomenon. And that is talking about the price of crude oil, the price of gas, let's just put it generally, the price of energy has gone up significantly around the world. Now, Nigeria as an oil producer ordinarily should benefit from this as an energy exporting country, so to say. Unfortunately, we cannot take advantage of that for the fact that there is oil theft that is so massive. So prices have gone up. Of course, they softened in recent weeks. Pitopec Plus is taking a position now to cut supply by 1 million barrels per day, which hopefully will show off the price of crude oil. But even at that, Nigeria is not benefiting from it because we are producing at probably about 50% of our capacity. Allocation of 1.8 million barrels per day. We are producing probably around 1 million bar barrels per day. That is leakage of about 800,000. Where ordinarily condensing, now that 800,000 would have been added to that to take us to 2.1 million barrels per day. Unfortunately, here we are, oil theft has deprived Nigeria of the opportunity of that. That is one side. The other side is the fact that Europe is in dire need of gas. Ordinarily, as a gas-rich country, Nigeria should have stepped up to fill that gap. Unfortunately, we have not managed our gas resources and plan effectively in the sense that when we talk about the LNG, and this is what most people don't even put in mind, every consignment you produce, you have signed a contract long term to supply the buyers. So in which case, what you have available is already locked up in existing contracts. So unless you now want to ramp up production or develop new fields, which we are not capable of doing very quickly. So that means, again, the gap created by Russia locking Nord Stream 1, which means they are not supplying gas to Europe right now. Nigeria also is unable to take advantage of that. Now, coming to the second issue, food insecurity, yes, is a global phenomenon, all right? And of course, different countries at different levels. Now, very few countries are food secure, but different countries around the world experience food insecurity at different levels. But the question for us is this, which Prof made reference to earlier on. I had signaled this as an issue to our government in Nigeria five years ago, and that we needed to take a very firm position and not see those who disrupt agricultural production as mere bandits or whomever. Plainly, if you look at the meaning of the word terrorism, it means whoever makes you unable to go to where you normally go for your normal, I mean, your daily economic activities is by all means a terrorist. So if what we are, the government is doing today in terms of security operations, we had done five years ago, we probably won't have concerns about food insecurity as we have today. But good enough, they've started doing things that we can see the impact. So let them intensify that so that people regain the confidence especially smallholder farmers, who return to their farms and start producing. So that means we ramp up local right. production of cash crops and food crops. Right, let's quickly bring in Professor Ndubisi uh, as we begin to course the conversation down. Uh, Professor Ndubisi, yeah. uh, the, the Senate has actually okayed uh, $73 per barrel uh, for, I mean, we're talking about the oil price now. A projection for 2023. And uh, the Senate has also approved a 3.6 trillion naira as subsidy on petroleum products for 2023. And on other parameters that has been improved or approved, uh, the new projection for borrowings at 8.437 trillion, including domestic borrowings, uh, which is subject to approval of the provision of details of borrowing plan by the National Assembly. However, uh, the conversation might just still go on. But my question here is, do you think that we're in sync with the current reality, with all of these projections? Is Nigeria really in sync with the current realities of the world? And not forgetting the fact that, you know, the oil prices have gone up, but there might also just be a cut in terms of the output by, you know, uh, OPEC. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Um, when you have an annual budget, uh, you make an estimate of what you think uh, the following year will look like. It, it's a plan. It's an annual plan on your finances, your revenue projections, and then how much you, you want to spend, and then how the income will come. So you get to assume, okay, let's assume $73 per barrel will, will be the average price for next year. 
that we can use to plan the expected revenue because it's a plan. So that is based on the perception of the planner. That uh, 73. So it's now for us to look at the global economy and then begin to assume that hopefully, do we think that the oil price will stay that long? If the if the Ukraine uh, Russia problem is solved between now and the end of this year, I don't know whether that price can be sustained. That is number one because the in, the, in, the the increasing price of crude oil is because of what is happening largely in that uh, uh, part of the world. So we need to be sure that the the price well, the benchmark price used for the budget it's, it's realistic. To me, I have some little question about that because whether the problems in, in Russia and Ukraine will not have been solved by next year. Then the other projections about uh, uh, the, the level of economic growth that, that, that has been expected and the other issues. To me, we need to, like I said earlier, to address the domestic issues. In terms of the leakages to our revenue, they are humongous. The leakages are humongous. And then the other area which government should do, should look at to, to be for revenue, is in terms of taxation. If you look at uh, Nigeria, the, the, the tax to GDP ratio in Nigeria is among the lowest on the continent. It's not, it's not taxing those who are already paying, but there are people who are not paying uh, you know, uh, their fair share of taxes. And then people who have private jets. I'm not about paying the, fair, you know, the, the right taxes. So the area of taxation, to, and also uh, to expand the tax net, these are areas that we can, the commission can look at in the budget to, to get to be free more, but, um, prof, more revenue. Address the issue of uh, oil tax, tax security. All right. Then, even if the price, yes. Uh, just quickly. Yes. Can uh, I go? yes, go ahead. So, it, if, so, even if the price of, of crude <clears throat> goes up higher than 73, that will be excess crude, crude uh, money. <clears throat> which will be good for us. But let us focus more on the domestic factor. That, in my opinion, that is the way forward. In planning the year's budget, putting the price uh, above 70 or 80 or and all that will be depending on what happens globally. Mm -hmm. Our focus in the budget, in my opinion, should be on those factors within our control. Enhance your level of taxation. Not on those, I'm just repeating myself, on those who are already paying, but those who are not paying Okay, the Prof, we, we, we're, we're out of time. Sorry, sir, we're out of time. Make sure so, you minimize yeah. the liquidity. Prof, ju ju sorry to interject. We're out of time. I just really quickly want to ask um, uh, Dr. Biodon Adedipo, just in a sentence on two, or two, sir, uh, do you think the, the increase of the, the CRR, the cash reserve ratio, recently by the CBN, or should I say, yeah, uh, the uh, Monetary Policy Committee will do anything to help this, this increase in inflation, also the increase in the interest rates? Very quickly, sir. Well, that's what I would call the textbook response <clears throat> to inflationary pressures. For central banks all around the world, the first response is the rate of interest at the monetary policy rate, which CBN did, moving it from 14 to 15.5. Then the second thing is to look at the reserve requirements. So those are the primary traditional tools central banks use. So what they have done, we say, in terms of managing the monetary system, is in the right direction. That is managing liquidity. Take money out of the banking system by freezing it. That's the essence of the cash reserve requirement so that you can reduce the pressure of liquidity that is driving All inflation. Right. Of course, right. that's update that to analysis, but that is a textbook response okay. to high inflation. All right. All right. All right. Uh, gentlemen, we have to call it a day at this point. Uh, we have so many questions to ask you, uh, but uh, we, we are out of time. The Professor NDBC in Wokoma, uh, Professor of Economics, or Economics rather, uh, Director, Center for Economic Policy Analysis and Research, SEPA, and Dr. Biodo Adedipe, um, who also is a founder and chief consultant of BAA Consult. Gentlemen, it's been a thrill having you. We've learned a lot from your analysis. Thank you so much. The pleasure. Thank Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. Thank you. I miss we should be ending diplomas in uh, economics today. <laughs> well, that's day. good. I mean, today. we should have more time to talk about it. But we we should be ending uh, diplomas in economics today. All right, we have more discussions ahead. We'll take a break then, and when we return, we'll be heading straight to our next conversation. Please stay with us.